allowing me to speak. And uh, I'd just like to thank God for this church. It's uh, probably a good place to start. <coughs> Once they're done with the baskets, we'll go ahead and pray for this, we'll pray for the message. And then we will go ahead and jump in. Um, today's message is going to be based on Ruth. I know you guys just went through Ruth, but I wanted to get something familiar um, while the pastor's away. And I figured if you just covered it, then it'll be a great opportunity to kind of review and also... We're going to be looking at it through the eye of how do we, how does God see our crisis? How does God see crisis in this world? So, uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the word. Um, I pray that you'll allow my words to be clear, that you'll allow them to resonate with the hearts of those who hear them or see them. Lord, we just ask that you be with us today and every day, that you work in our lives, that you give us a softened heart one that is compassionate and caring and sacrificial, just as your son came and did for us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your abundant love, and we look forward to all of the days that we walk with you. Amen. So, to give you an idea um, who I am, uh, let's see, I am 29, about to turn 30, as you found out, I'm getting married next month, uh, taking a big jump, so that's always fun. Um, I graduated from Liberty uh, Seminary, to become a preacher, and I am living just north of Philadelphia in a town called Hatfield. It's about half an hour north of Philly. So it's been an interesting couple months. <coughs> this, last few, this last year, um, starting to plan for a wedding, figure out where we're going to live afterwards. We have three moves coming up this summer, so we're going to move into my apartment, and then we're going to move back into her apartment, then we're going to move wherever God leads us. Um, so it's been a lot of stress. But I, I was looking at the news last night, and one of the big news articles, I don't know if you've had a chance to see this, is the quake that happened over in Nepal. And uh, when I looked at it last week, kind of just writing out the outline for tonight, it was at 1,000 people, and I was like, wow, that's devastating. Like, can you imagine you're, you're taking your kid or you're hanging out with your friends one day, and then the next day you're trying to bury them out of the building? I couldn't imagine. And then last night, I was, it was up to 1,800 people. And it's, that's just phenomenal. Like, the entire city is just leveled. Uh, families, homes, towns, gone. And so it's that idea of a crisis. Like they, anybody that's connected to that is in a crisis. And in this morning's Bible study, many of you are either dealing or recovering from a crisis in your lives, whether it's a loss of your health or a loss of a family member or a friend or a spouse. We all handle crisis in different ways, but what does that mean for a believer? What does that mean for somebody who's devoted their lives to Jesus? And we have to look at this from a different point of view. The Bible states that we're not of this world, and the song we just sang is that there is a place in heaven for us, but what do we do in the meantime until we get there? And we have to allow the Bible to speak to us, allow its word to come alive in our lives so that we can live it out, and it's not just something that we're reading or studying or an activity that we do with our church friends, but it's a matter of how we live and how does that look differently. And so the question, there's four questions I have for us today. The first one is, where is God when it all falls apart? When, when life gets difficult, when things hit the bottom, when there's nowhere else to turn, when you think like just giving up, or when you're helping a friend who has nowhere else to go, and you're that one friend that just talks to them, and that you're that comfort for them, so where is God when it all falls apart? In the poll, there's thousands upon thousands of people asking, is there a God because of the devastation that's happening? When 9-11 happened, we asked as a country the same thing. Where was God when the Twin Towers fell? Um, in each of our lives, we ask that when depression strikes, when isolation takes over, and we look at it and we ask ourselves, where is he? Why is this happening to me? And so we can face all these activities, and our response dictates is based on our faith. And so, how we respond determines our faithfulness to God. And we look at Ruth, and we it's interesting that the first half of the book of Ruth isn't really even about Ruth, it's about Naomi. And so, in order to understand where Naomi's coming from, and to try to get some type of relationship with her, you have to look at the times that she's living in. I kind of just pinpointed seven main points of the time. Um, there was no, it was a brand new nation. It wasn't really stabilized. 
Uh, there was no real government in place. Any form of leadership was unqualified and without vision or direction. People were afraid and poor. They were often under threat of foreign attackers and lacked a sense of stability. People sort of looked at God to lead their lives, but it wasn't something that was evident. They did the best they could, but when things got difficult, they mostly went on their own abilities. Moral and ethics were much more relative. So for the most part, it's exactly like it is today. 3,000 years difference, we're still kind of in the same boat. Um, our high schoolers, our middle schoolers, their faith is pretty much relative to what they believe is true. Um, and I mean, that can stretch all the way through, but it's definitely in a postmodern society evident of that. So we have this relationship between Naomi and Ruth that's almost identical to where we are. So we look at them and we ask, so where was God for her? If God is going to get us through our struggles, well, let's look at the characters that, of the people who walked before us to find out how God got them through those. So Ruth's story really begins with Elimelech, who is basically Naomi's husband, Ruth's father-in-law. And this was a guy who, there's not a lot about him, but when you look at the context, he's a man, to, let's see, he appears to have been a man of faith who did not or could not be fully faithful. Yes, he accepted God as his God, but he wasn't living it. He wasn't active in his faith. He was very passive in this. Um, it's assumed, assumed that they moved out of the promised land because uh, they didn't want him to be a leader. He had the privilege through being related through the leadership, but they didn't respect him as a leader. And once the famine came, he up and took his wife and two kids and left to live in an area that basically thought he was an idiot for worshiping God. It was an area where their false idols were so dominant that they didn't have anything else. And so we look at this, and it's very much on the society that we live in today. We look around, and there's plenty of worship. There's plenty of, we worship celebrities, we worship Hollywood, we worship our own ability to do things. Um, we can do it bigger, better, and more powerful, and usually prettier. But at the same point, we're such in a spiritual famine that it's not working. No matter how much we try, we can't get the family to stop arguing. We can't keep our uh, divorce rate under 50%. We can't keep our kids from being depressed or hanging out with the wrong type of kids. And so something has to give. And so we, we going back to him, he moves out to this area where there is no temple, there is no worshiping of God, except for the false ones. His two kids end up marrying non-believers, and they bring them into faith. But even then, that was looked upon, down upon through their laws. Um, So the second question I have for us is, how are we any different? Do we run from God's challenges? Do we run from his discernment, his discipline? Or are we willing to face those challenges and wrap our lives around community, around those who care about us and are looking out for our best interests? And so often it causes backsliding when we turn our backs on God. It causes that idea of, well, I can just, I, can, I don't need to come to church on Sunday. I can just manage this weekend and next weekend. Or I don't need to hang out with fr friends from church. Like, that doesn't matter. I'm hanging out with my other friends. And slowly it just erodes at our faith where we're not following God and the purpose and plan that he has for us. So what happens next? Well, crisis. The husband dies. The two sons die. And now Naomi is stuck with her two daughter-in-laws trying to figure out what to do next. Um, they just buried it. They have no status left in the town because they, the town's people feel like God, their gods are punishing them for believing in a foolish god in their eyes. They have, there's no man of the household. Uh, there's no way to work the farm anymore. So the only thing left is to move back. But at the same point, let's put herself in Naomi's shoes. She just buried her husband, and she just buried her two kids next to him. There's about a 10-year span between the two, but how much can a person do before they can't take any more? And so often, there's people in our lives that are just struggling and they're hurting, and they're just desperate for somebody to say, it's going to get better. 
And so, at that time where you're dealing with the grief, you're dealing with the despair, the God, where are you in all of this? We sometimes ask ourselves, is God really punishing us for not being perfect? Did we do something so despicably wrong that God is saying, you know what, you did wrong, you're, gonna, you're being punished for it. And it's easy to look with all the teachings that Jesus had and say, no, God would never punish us because Jesus atoned for all of our sin. Romans 8 states, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But then we're still stuck with this idea of why are bad things still happening to me if I'm trying to follow Jesus? And sometimes things just happen. There's many um, parables in the Bible through Jesus that bad things happen and it was nobody's fault. When life falls apart, it's not our fault. It's just we got something we have to work through. And it's so important that we wrap our lives in community, that we surround ourselves with people who love God and love us. Because without that, we, we backslide, we fall away, we get distracted. And when that happens, more and more stuff just keeps happening, and we have no foundation to handle that. So, so here we are with Naomi, not sure what to do. Well, we, we need to ask ourselves, what would we do? Would we continue to fight? Would we continue to stay where we're at? Would we run? Now, in her case, she decided to move back home. She had no source of income, nowhere to live. It made the most logical sense, but at the same point, she, her children, her daughters, daughter-in-laws, they're the only ones left. So she basically says, you know what, you're free. You don't have to come with me on this long journey. It's not like she jumped in a plane and went home. But at the same point, it, it, like, we come up with these solutions on how to make things better. Uh, if I just buy a new dress, I'll look more beautiful, or for the women. Um, <laughs> or if I just work a little bit better and get that pay raise, then I'll have enough money to pay the bills. Or if we just sell this, this car and get something a little bit more stable, then we'll be okay. Or if we just get that next thing, that'll make everything all right, and we're, we just miss it. Because no matter how much we improve, no matter how high we climb up the corporate ladder, we're still discontent. We're still missing the whole point of why we're here. And it's one of those things where when you look at your purpose in life, when you look at what really matters, when you look at, the, when you're 97 years old and you're looking back at your life and you look at what's important, you're gonna remember the lives that you impacted, the people that you touched and the people that you cared for even though you didn't even know them. Those are what's gonna change things. But we, we try so hard to chase this American dream to figure out what makes us happy, instead of, it just works as a distraction towards us from even knowing God. But with Naomi, in her suffering, in her pain, she was blessed with the opportunity to say, what is left in my life when I lose everything? And she said, God is still God, his promises are still true, and she can lean on those. And so she heard that the famine was over in Bethlehem, and she decided to move home. And she, she went home based on a promise, based on something she heard. And that's really, at the end of the day, all we have. All we have is God's promises to keep our marriages strong, to give us the strength to get through the day, to love on our children the way that they need with grace and patience and caring and gentleness. And without those promises, we're just rushing through life to nothing. It's uh, the old slogan, hurry up and wait. <coughs> so we look at this book of Ruth, and we look at Naomi, and we look at all that she went through, and hopefully our heart breaks for her, just as it breaks for our neighbors who are struggling, just as it breaks for that offering that we just took up. There's so much hurt in this world. We don't need to go overseas to Nepal to see it. We can look right across the road. If we listen closely at night, we can hear the arguments. And if we're, if we're in a school, I mean, a public school. What greater testimony is there to hardships than what our high schoolers and middle schoolers go through. Uh, everything gets flipped around for them. And then we graduate them out of high school and send them off to college and they have to deal with hardships even more. But during these times of grief, during this time of crisis, we have to remember what's important. 
And that brings me to my next question. What, do we, what should we do? What would we do in her place? And I kind of touched base on this already, but how do you respond to a person in pain? Like, if you work at a hospital, you're surrounded by it all day. But if you're working outside of people, outside of contacting those that you're close about, if all your friends and family are very shallow, superficial conversations, then really you can just avoid it. But in avoiding it, you're falling into your own isolation. That's, that's really what Elimelech did, is he avoided it. He didn't stay in Bethlehem with his wife and two kids. He turned his back on it and went away from the promised land. He went away from God's promises. And so often we can do the same thing. So what should we do? Do we sell all of our stuff and give it to the poor? Do we live out of our van? Do we sit around studying the Bible for eight hours a day? No, not necessarily unless God calls you to it. But God's calling you to something. I mean, just if you look around in your life, if you look in your families, what do they need the most? Sometimes they need something tangible, like money to pay the bills. Sometimes your neighbor will need food and groceries because they can't afford anything. Other times they just need somebody to hear them. They just need to go to lunch or go to dinner or invite a friend over for dinner and say, you know what, I know you're dealing with something stressful. Let's talk about it. And then instead of us trying to fix it, we just listen. That's the best thing we can do to show somebody that we love them, is just listen to them. So we find Naomi trapped in the situation of having to head back home. Broken, lost, no family, no one to be with her, completely isolated. In verse 6, she actually asked God, you know, why are you punishing me for this? And so often we can too. And those that we love, those that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and even many of us who do, we ask that same question, God, why are, you, why are you making this happen? Why are you allowing this to happen? And we just look at it from the pain and the hurt that's built up inside us because we've never been able to properly grieve. And that's one of the best things we can do in our society. It's so wrong for us to cry over anything. But yet, how can we ever move on past hurt and pain until we release it? So coming back to Naomi, she, she releases her two daughters and says, you know what, you are wonderful to my sons. I love you both. Um, go back home to your families. Go back to your loved ones. She didn't have any left. So she was going to go back to the only place that she knew. But God was answering a prayer and all that through Ruth. God allowed Ruth to build such a connection that it wasn't just through marriage. It was, Ruth felt like Naomi's daughter born daughter. It wasn't something legally bound. It wasn't something that, oh, because they're a friend of a friend. It's a matter of what it's supposed to look like when we love God and love others. That we, we give sacrificially, that we care about people. We're not going to leave them abandoned in their time of need. We're going to be there with them. And ironically enough, Naomi does the same thing we would do. No, no, you go. I'll be okay. Pride. We're so afraid to let people in. But isn't that exactly what we're asking God for? Just to have a few people that we can rely on when things get difficult? When God brings us challenges in life, wouldn't it be great to have a sister or a brother to just come and spend the time with? And that's exactly what God answered her prayer. The promise that she's not alone, that we aren't alone. That's what God answered. As a church, we are not alone. We have the access to other believers that care about you, that want to spend time with you, that want to be a part of your life. Um, with one of the organizations I partner with, GCM, it, one of the catchphrases that they have is that you share life on life. And as a family, that's exactly what you do. You don't just show up and wait for people to cater to you. You go out and you meet the needs of the people. You care about them and you love on them, asking nothing in return. Because that's what your parents do to your kids. That's, that's what we're called to do. And without that, the cross doesn't mean anything. And that's a very harsh statement. But if we're not loving God first and he's not pouring into our lives, then there's no way we can care about anyone but ourselves. And it's when we break that pride, like Naomi had to do with Ruth, and say, Ruth, I love you, and I want you to come with me. I'm so thankful you're here. And it, in the Bible it says they wept openly. 
Like, how beautiful is that? That's exactly what we want. We can see God's promises answered in our life through his word. And we can know that it's true. And it was a long time before Naomi could trust Ruth on that. But eventually she could. She could lean on her for that comfort and that support that we're so desperate for. And it's just a very sad story so far. But we see God coming through and restoring all the brokenness. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover three and four, but we look at that and we say, God was there. Why, why can't he be there in our lives? Well, because our story is not finished yet. God is still moving mountains in our lives. For those challenges that are coming up with your work, with your family, with relationships, with tests, God is still moving mountains and he's shaping us to be ready for those. Naomi wouldn't have been ready to go back to the promised land if she didn't first have to let go of the things that were holding her away from God's community. And it was only after God had to remove some of the stumbling blocks, which were things that she loved dearly. These weren't bad people. They were her kids and her husband. <coughs> but God had something else. And because she was obedient and going back to God's word, she met a man named Boaz. They had a child, Obed, and then that child had Jesse, who had David, who became king of Israel. And through that, we have the Messiah, the Savior, Lord Jesus. Everything that was prophesied hundreds of years before was foretold because of her obedience. And it wasn't always easy. Most of the time, while she's burying the graves of her children, it was very difficult. But it all works out because God's promises are true and it's something we can rely on. So just to recap, these are the four questions I want us to kind of reflect on throughout this week. Where is God when it all falls apart? Where do we turn when life doesn't go our way? Who do we blame when life's tragedies seem unfair? And what are we going to do about it? Because at the end of the day, it's not all about us. It's about God. And while we might want it to be about us, when we flip it around in our lives and place the priorities on Him, because it's all about Him, it's going to be really, really difficult to bury the things that keep us wrong. But in the end, it's going to work out in ways that you can't even possibly imagine. So I think we need to take some time, sometime this week, get together, have a meal with somebody, talk about that, having that somebody in your life that cares, that loves, working on those relationships that are going to be there past when you change grades, when you change jobs. We shouldn't be dictating our relationships and our friendships based on where we work or what church we go to. It should be the people that God brings in our lives. They're all for a season. And there's a reason that God brings them in, because we need them in our lives. Or they need us. And so like Naomi and Ruth, we will either be in a crisis, or we'll be the ones to answer the crisis. And we step out in faith and trust, and then it all works out. So that's my message. Um, I'm just going to pray real quick, and then I think we have a song now. Afterwards. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, I just hope that you use this word that you spoke in between my words to allow us to lighten our hearts, that you soften them, that you allow the people in our lives to be placed on them, that we can have an opportunity or find an opportunity to care for those people, that Lord, Lord that we can surrender our lives to you, that through you all things are made new by trusting in you, Lord, and having a relationship with you, that we can know what the gospel means. We can know that your word holds authority in our lives. That as believers, we are called for a higher purpose than just making money and having a nice house. Lord, we ask that you work in our lives, that you answer our prayers for health, that you answer the and fix the brokenness in our relationships, that you let us place you in the highest priority, that nothing comes in our way between us and you, Lord. And Lord, help us remove the things that keep us from you. Don't let us wander so far from your word and your community that we forget who you are. Lord, we ask these things because we are hopelessly and desperately weak to keep them in our lives. It's only through your grace and your spirit that empowers us, Lord. As your sons and daughters, we cry out to you, if not for us, for those in our lives that need you, for the lost people that surround us, that we can reach them with the gospel, that we can love on them until they know you, that they can see your life evident in ours. 
Lord, without these things, our lives are just pointless and meaningless, that we wander from entertainment and distraction to the next big thing, and the next big phone, the next big whatever. Lord, just let these truths sink into our hearts. Let our promises guard our hearts from all that is wrong, and all that keeps us from you. And Lord, let us have a deep desire to know you, to be with you, and to love you above all things. Amen.